Okay. So good evening, everyone. I have two two presentations today um, because uh, due to some uh, scheduling errors on my part, I must say, I couldn't give the last one that was scheduled a couple of weeks ago when I was away. So I'll be doing two presentations, and the first one is going to be on the reflective surgical trainee. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who came in a little bit later, I actually put a message on the chat group saying, while I'm presenting and before and um, while I start before I start, can you think of a recent incident you've had at work? Right. Um, could be a complication you had with a surgery, an incident with a patient, um, anything, right? Uh, an issue of conflict, perhaps with your colleagues, or maybe an, a misunderstanding with your supervisor. Because uh, uh, I, as many of you know, I like to have an interactive session. And I'm hoping that once we go through the various steps of reflective practice, we can use perhaps incidents or examples from your own practice, from your own work, so that we can put it directly into practice, yeah? So I'm going to start with uh, my presentation. Let me see. Uh, yep. There we go. Um, I'm going to start my slideshow. Uh, where's my slideshow? Pay for the start. Yeah, okay. So do do you have the right view on your screen? Is it presenter view or is it the correct view? So someone just tell me. Otherwise I have to change it. It's correct view. Yeah, yeah correct view. Yes, okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the reflective surgical trainee. Yeah. First of all, what is reflective practice? A long definition here, but basically it is a process where an individual, you, me, all of us here, we think analytically about anything related to their professional practice with the intention of gaining insight and using the lessons learned to maintain good practice or make improvements where possible. Okay, so basically what is it? It's thinking about or reflecting on what you do. And very importantly, it is learning from that experience and that experience can be both good or bad. Yeah. So don't mistake it for uh, m and or uh, root cause analysis. Yeah, we would, um, reflective practice is something that is much more personal. It's thinking about how it has impacted you and what you personally will do moving forward, right? So why should we do it? It is a means to address issues such as diagnostic decision making, medical errors, cultural competence, professionalism lapses, burnout. You can see that all these things sometimes related to a particular complication or an incident, but actually overall it can it encompasses many, many aspects of your daily practice. Yeah. Um, essentially, what we want at the center of this Venn diagram is better patient care, right? And how we contribute to better patient care is making creating a safer culture, creating safer systems, and creating safer professionals. Right. And um, reflective practice is something probably more recent in our culture because it's not something that we do instinctively or uh, naturally um, but it is something that actually has been in existence for a long time already yeah and in, in the surgical workplace is certainly a little bit newer than in other workplaces but also very very important in our surgical uh, environment so how do we do reflective practice so there are a few models that we can follow yeah there are many many models out there but basically, they all involve a process of looking back on and looking forward. So what's looking back on? Looking back on means you're looking back at the incident or the complication or the risk or the misunderstanding, right? Uh, so to identify a clear focus for the reflection. You explore it, making personal connections. It is something that you look at with the intention of thinking about how you felt about it, how it affected you, and what was your response to it. You use multiple perspectives, so we'll go through that a little bit later. And very importantly, it is not just about looking at the thing, but actually about looking forward, which means that you have a specific plan for learning or improving your own mental model, behavior and practice. Again, a reminder, it can be something good or something bad. Yeah. So this is one of the reflection models that is uh, not quite 
sure how to pronounce shown, skern, shown, whatever, yeah? But basically reflection in action, which is at the time the event is happening. So you're thinking about the experience itself, thinking about it during the event, deciding how to act at the time and then acting immediately. Alternatively, it, can, it also includes reflection on action, which means that you are reflecting on it after the event. So what, what this means is reflecting on something that has happened, thinking about what you might do differently if it happened again, and what new information you can learn or what theoretical perspectives you can obtain that can inform your experience. Okay, so, so what does this mean? Reflection in action is actually quite difficult yeah, because we're usually caught up in an emotion of the moment and you're not really actually thinking about it. You're not kind of taking a step back and thinking, well, how am I responding? It's usually quite instinctive. Yeah? And, you, and often we find that when we have an, a very emotional reaction, you may not actually be, ref, be responding in the wisest way possible, yeah? which is why the reflection on action is very important. After an incident, you have reflected on it so that the next time it happens again, you are not having to figure things out at, this, at that particular time, but you already have a plan and action plan in mind. So this is one model called the uh, Schoen's Schoen model. Right? This is a much more common model, which is the Gibbs reflective cycle. So you see this a lot more in our uh, medical education and medical training models, right? You start off with a description, what happened. Then your feelings, what were you thinking and feeling? Then your evaluation, which is what was good and bad about the experience. Then your analysis, what else can you make of the situation? A conclusion, what else you could have done? And then, very importantly, the action plan. If this happens again, what would you do? Would you do something different? Or did you respond very well and therefore you should keep doing the same thing? Yeah? And, and there's a cycle because obviously the next time it happens again, you want to make sure that you have learned that lesson and put it in place. Yeah? So remember, reflection is personal. There's no one way to reflect. I can't tell you, okay, you must reflect this certain way and you didn't do it, it's wrong. No, yeah? it's supposed to be a very personal process. You must have time to reflect on both the positive and negative experiences. And this is important for your well-being. Right? So if someone is constantly reflecting on all the negative experiences they have, not very healthy. right? You want to also focus on the things that you did well so that you can continue doing those things. Now, group reflection is quite interesting because you can reflect as a group. So as a group of trainees, as a group of specialists, as a group of, say, um, teachers, trainers, educators, yeah? We can actually put this process into practice as a group. So we're kind of look, talking about it to each other. And I'm sure you've all done it at various points already, right? When something happens to a patient, you may have, may, I'm sure many, if not all of you, have already put this into practice. It's just that you weren't aware that it was a reflective practice. And very importantly, point number four is that the healthcare team should discuss openly and honestly what has happened when things go wrong. Remember, this is not about looking for blame. It is not about looking for um, who was at fault. What we need to focus on is, can we prevent it from happening again for the sake of the patients we treat in the future? Yeah? Um, okay, so this is what I mentioned just now. Reflections should not substitute or override other processes that are necessary to record, escalate, or discuss significant events or serious incidents. So this is not a root cause analysis. This is not an M&M meeting. This is not our six monthly uh, department of surgery audit. Yeah? This, is a, this is something that is much more personal. Um, sometimes you may keep a note or a journal, a reflective journal, that is what is often recommended in other training uh, areas, you know, in the UK or Australia. If you're keeping a journal, remember, you, try, you must anon anonymize it. Don't say, don't make one long name, the whole name uh, with RN and everything, yeah? Um, or sometimes a patient may have a very unusual name that even writing one word of their patient's name already identifies their patient. So you must be aware that if you are keeping these notes in a diary or a journal, that you should be anonymizing the information. And, so, and for us, me as a tutor or supervisor or employee or appraiser, we also should remember that we need to give the time and space for individual and group reflection. This is a very, very important process. It cannot be rushed and it must be done in an environment where you feel that you are safe to do so. You don't want to be criticized for various decisions that you made when you are in this process of reflection. Yeah? So, so a reminder for those of us here 
who are tutors or supervisors. This is a very important culture to create in our units. Okay, so remember I said what to reflect on. You can reflect on something that went wrong. It can be a post-op complication, you missed the diagnosis, maybe the diagnosis was delayed, a patient was dissatisfied, a procedure that failed, right? What went wrong? Importantly also, you should also reflect on what went right. For example, you managed a cardiac arrest very well. Or there was an interesting seminar or conference that you helped to organize or you spoke at and which received very good feedback. Yeah? Or a patient thank you letter. That's always very nice to, to read. Yeah? A, a thank you letter from a patient. And, or perhaps you did a difficult but well-performed procedure. So you did it well. Maybe you did it um, independently for the first time, right? Uh, or even maybe it's not a very difficult procedure, but you've done one of your core procedures well, skin to skin for the first time. So this is something that you should also reflect on what went right. Okay, so um, I'm going to give an exam. Okay, I'm, actually I'm going to ask for volunteers. Any volunteers? I ask you guys to think about something that has happened. Could be good, could be bad. I wonder if I can get a volunteer from the audience to talk about something that has happened maybe in the past one or two weeks. Just a very brief description. Hmm, we will start calling out names. I could. I'm going to give a chance for people to volunteer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to wait for a bit. Okay, I tell you what, I'm going to give the example first. Yeah, this is an example taken from uh, an, um, uh, an article on reflection. Just to give people a bit of space to think about what might be a uh, suitable example. Okay, so this is one example. I was involved in a patient confrontation. Patient was unhappy with the hospital stay, wanted to discharge home. But she had to go to the nursing home, so could not be discharged. I explained this, she returned to a bed. I was happy, I explained everything to her, continued with my other jobs. Okay, very simple, very basic, very brief. Okay, not much reflection involved here. Okay, but this is, a, this, this is the basic uh, uh, outline of the situation. Yeah? Anyone would like to volunteer with something? Something. Okay, I'm on a small screen here. I can't see who is, who is. Um... Hi, Prof. Yes, who's that? Ridwan here from Peak Surgery. Ah, oh, Ridwan. Okay, all right. Well done, Ridwan. <laughs> Before I call you, huh? Okay. All right. Yes. So, how, what would you like to share? Actually, we have an. I actually say incident. Uh, can be as example or not. Like we have an incident where we met uh, unhappy parents, lah. Like, in the hospital during the clinic review where the son had a, a, we call a neuro regression problem after the multiple general anesthesia. At that time he was, uh, I don't know it's called blaming us, uh, that we don't do a proper uh, pre-operative uh, counselling. So that a point that uh, he said that we should mention that uh, neuroregression is part of the complication of a multiple GA. Uh, he give uh, evidence in uh, from the journal that he read. So this what uh, made him unhappy lah and blaming us lah. Mm. Mm. And this okay. is part of example, bro. Uh, mm. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is an interesting example because I'm going to get. I, 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 we have at least two perspectives on this example, right? So uh, we have the perspective of the trainee. So uh, Dr. Ridwan here was one of those people who observed the interaction, and I was the managing surgeon, right? So I can also give you my perspective and my reflection as the managing surgeon. So for uh, I'll just recap what the issue was. The issue was that uh, there was a pair of unhappy parents of a four-year-old boy with multiple congenital abnormalities and who has had multiple general uh, multiple surgeries done under general anesthesia uh, from the age uh, since he was born basically yeah because of his multiple con congenital abnormalities and what the parents had come in suddenly after four years after manage, we were managing him for four years and actually he has not had any recent GAs uh, um, at four years of age his parents say very upset because they recently it recently came to the attention that there was some previous research before which indicated that there might be a relationship between multiple general anesthesia 
and global developmental delay. Okay, and they were very upset. They said they had never been explained this before, and um, they should have been told. And they would, if they had been told, they would have avoided all the general anesthesia. Yeah, for all those congenital abnormalities, except for when it was uh, life saving. Yeah, so that was the that was the crux of their argument. Okay, now that is the that is the situation. All right, that is the situation. We're going to talk through this using the principles of reflective practice okay so this is a this, we start with the top description of the event number two is description of the feelings number three evaluating experience number four is analysis number five our conclusion and number six a pers personal action plan okay so so these are the steps that we're going to go through yeah anyone who wants to ask questions who wants to clarify anything please stop us we're using a pediatric surgical uh, example, but you can imagine that any this kind of uh, misunderstanding or, or miscommunication or an, a pair of upset uh, upset patients, caregivers, parents in our setting can conceiv con con conceivably happen in any of our surgical settings. Yeah, so this is what we're going to go through. All right. So first, description of the event: what, where, who, the situation. We keep it anonymized, so I don't think I've revealed any details, right? No personal details, right? You you, you can't uh, you can't go through uh, the the thing and identify who this patient is, right? Unless you were actually there in that situation, yeah. So first of all, we have described what the problem was, where now where did this take place? So read one. I'm going to give you a choice, yeah. Uh, and I think there are a couple of others who were there at the at the at the. At the at the interaction as well. So I'm going to give a chance for a few people to talk about this. Where did this take place? And we already mentioned the who. So where did this take place? Uh, the place was happened in, the, in our uh, general clinics. Mm, right. So it happened in our outpatient clinic. Yeah. So why is the where important? Because if you think about it, it's in our outpatient clinic, which means that it may be a crowded, overcrowded clinic, it may be that it is the 20th, 30th patient we have seen that day. Yeah, it may be that we have many more patients waiting to see us, which means what can happen? One of the things that can happen is that we may not have the time, right, or the patience, or the uh, flexibility to address the situation completely to the satisfaction of all the parties, right? So, so that's why the where is very important. If it's a where where it's very noisy, rushed, maybe no privacy. I know some clinics run with two patients in the same room, right? I know, I mean, I don't like to run clinics like that, but we, we know that there are some, some clinics where it's so busy, you're seeing so many patients that you're even seeing patients two to one room. And that can be very difficult situation to deal with when you're dealing with unhappy patients or caregivers or parents yeah so so that's why what where and who all very important so we've described it right so what's next description of feelings yeah now this is very important okay so i can share later on what i felt okay but uh, actually i would like to hear from the mo's how you felt when you saw this whole thing maybe some someone who was there who who, who was not ridwan Hmm? Who else was there? Hi, Mei here, bro. Ah, okay, all right, Mei. Okay, yes. So, so look at oh. this. Yeah, describe how you feel. Right? How did it make you feel? Confused, angry, frustrated, helpless, bully, whatever. Please, proud, whatever. Yeah. So, so uh, what was your emotional state? Yeah. Initially, I felt it was a bit ridiculous. Mm. Then, uh, but but at the back of uh, feeling that ridiculous towards the incident, actually, I felt um the parents must have experienced a lot of difficulty in handling the situation that's why and they must have felt the guilt that's wait, why wait, they wait. Are... you're jumping you're jumping ahead that's your analysis there later later okay, okay, how did okay. you feel ah at that time okay. how did you feel ah so you felt number one you felt it was ridiculous so but what was your feeling yeah. Mm. <laughs> mm. uh yeah uh i want to tell angry not really yeah. angry mm. i felt uh Annoying, yeah, a bit, a bit, a bit irritated also lah. Mm, irritated, uh, annoyed, huh? What, what else? What else? Huh? Like, huh? 
What's wrong with these parents? Huh? Right? What's wrong with these parents? You already do so much for them. We already call. We already do so many surgeries. So we already take care of them so much. What's wrong with them? Right? That, I mean, that that's that's a very natural yes. uh, reaction, right? Okay, okay. So next, that's your description of feelings. Yeah. Now, I, I want to I want to look at this frustrated, helpless, bullied. Um, that very often happens in a situation where you feel you have no control over that situation, especially when you're at junior levels. Yeah. So you have to recognize that when you feel bullied, you might react in a very, uh, again, in quite an unwise way. So you must recognize that feeling. Okay. So next, how do you make you feel then? Ah, then evaluation of experience. Why did it happen? Right? What are the different perspectives we can consider? And what are the contributing factors? Okay. So then we're talking about your evaluation so uh, maybe you, you jump ahead just now so what's your evaluation of the experience now that you're looking back right you have time to think about it you're not there listening to the the parents make uh, an, uh, weird accusations right you're not uh, listening to them showing uh, showing you research papers that are out of date right so now looking back what what do you think yeah i think because in the end after all the explanation the very long explanation they finally can accept the uh, the situation and they agreed uh, that GA doesn't cause this neuro development, developmental delay. So, uh, and it's evident, evidence based. So, I think after thinking back to the, uh, the whole situation, actually, they, they wanted, um, maybe they, they just wanted more explanation and they, they want to prove that actually they, it's not their fault for, um, for uh, trying to to forward and to trying to make us to uh, do the operation earlier, so and causing this developmental delay. So I think they just want some uh, evidence and explanation for yeah. Mm. No, I think I think they are, they are guilty like I think mm. they're yeah. Okay, so so uh, I, uh, to I think to make things clearer for the rest of our uh, colleagues here who are, who are not who are not present there. Uh, a few a few issues came up. So these parents, number one, they said that he had um, under the, the their child had undergone multiple general anesthesias for surgeries that were not required, right? And of course, logically, we know that we never recommend certainly in pediatric surgery we never recommend surgeries that are not required. There's always a clinical indication for the surgeries that we offer. Number one, yeah. Number two, they also had different ideas of what was life-saving versus what was not. Because technically, pretty much 90% of surgeries are not technically life-saving. But for us in pediatric surgery, often it is time-sensitive in the sense that if you do it early, you can help with their function and their eventual quality of life, which is what our target is as pediatric surgeons, right? But number three, these parents actually have always been a little bit difficult yeah inverted commas difficult and um, they were always pushing us to do surgery a lot of the surgery uh, surgeries earlier they were always a little bit upset when there were delays due to various issues such as uh, you know a urti that caused a delay and in fact some a couple of the surgeries were done during covid and obviously there were delays due to covid as well right so um so what eventually came up in our conversation with the parents was that the father the father said if I had known about this, I would not. I, I, if I had known about this, um, I would not have pushed for the surgeries to be done earlier because now I feel guilty. Now he said that during the session, and then and then you have an understanding that a lot of the 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 difficulty in the communication is because the parents felt guilty. And guilt about a decision that you've made for your child is actually a very, very strong and powerful emotion. Yeah, and what we are seeing is the result of that emotion. Okay, so uh, contributing factors already got delayed because of COVID, right? URTI, right? Or uh, other perspectives. Sometimes what we see as surgeons is different from what patients see, and more importantly, in our case, what parents see. Yeah. Okay, so. Analysis and conclusion. What could we have done anything different? Could we have done anything differently, right? And are there lessons here that we can transfer to other situations? Okay, why, why? different person. So Ridwan, uh, Mayi, you've answered. Anyone else was there? I think Navina, you were there, right? What was your, what was the lesson that you drew from it? No. 
So the lesson is, um, I think how we explain to them is also important. How we convey our message and uh, we should give them space to uh, actually tell what they think and uh, to convey their, what, uh, what is their, in, you know, what's their, what's their concern, the actual concern. And then we have to try to explain from our side. And uh, I think we should always uh, try to maintain uh, uh, our, we shouldn't be like, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be what, sorry? No, no. Uh, we, we should always uh, maintain a calm, calm posture during the, during when we, con we are confronted such by by such parents or something so that uh there is no much uh like they don't become defensive or we are shouldn't be like yeah i think it's more of like how we confront them and also uh we should have uh, updates on what is happening so that it's easier for us to uh, mm. talk to them also okay all right so so a few things you said here right one is the manner of the communication right we should try to not we should so not confront right we don't want to be confrontational right we want to state the facts clearly and calmly correct but we want to maintain a calm atmosphere isn't it which is not easy yeah not 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 easy to maintain yeah number two is that you you brought up a good point is actually we ourselves need to be updated about research and about evidence so that when we get questions like this we're able to respond with good evidence yeah and this, this is why we teach the principles of research methodology and critical appraisal of papers because there will be times when it looks like the the patient or the caregivers or whoever have done more research than us and that's not good yeah we should always be up to date on the things that we treat and number three i think you you you, you brought up um uh, one point is give people space right so what happened in this particular case was that we said, okay, this is a busy clinic. We cannot completely resolve this. Can we arrange a separate time to come back? And then we can talk about this again with the experts who are required, right? So this is, the, we actually did all these three things, yeah? Okay, good. So how will this change my practice? I know, for example, certainly I've learned the hard way to, through um, ver uh, various previous experiences with such situations that it's important to main, maintain a calm demeanor and, and actually let them speak their mind without cutting them or interrupting them. Yeah? And then sometimes that allows things, sentences come, to come out that reveal why they are behaving that, like this. For example, when the, when the parents said, I feel guilty for pushing for earlier surgery. And that was a very key moment that he, was, that he revealed his feelings. Yeah? And obviously, we encounter a similar situation again. These are the lessons we have learned. And reinforce what happens when you put this into practice. So you don't have to wait for some, uh, uh, a misunderstanding to happen again, right? You can always, um, before that, you can proactively address many of these issues already beforehand. Okay? So that was this. I think this is my final slide. We want to have a culture of reflection where we're encouraging each other to reflect on what has happened. We need time and space to do that. Sometimes you cannot reflect when it's immediately happening or the, on that day because you might feel very upset, you might feel bullied, you might feel confused. Sometimes you need to return to that a few days later, a week later, and then talk to others who are experiencing the, the, the same situation, right? And it's important also that you get trusted guidance from mentors because you want good guidance on if it were to happen again, how you would behave in that same situation. What is the best way to behave? Okay, yeah. Uh, any questions, thoughts or comments from anyone else in the meeting? Yes, I see a few general surgical trainees. Anything you want to comment on? Hi, Prof. She can hear. Yes, she can. Mm. Prof, I just wanted to ask as a trainee or the, the juniors, so if let's say we are doing some mistakes or anything, right? So mm. we did reflect, we did some reflection, but how do we actually move on from the mistake that we did and yeah, just keep going? 
Mm. Well, that's a very good question. Advice. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's a great question because you may have feelings that it's very hard for you to resolve, right? Uh, I mean, one, one thing that's very common as a surgical trainee, when a complication happens, you can feel actually, number one, guilty. You should have done better. You shouldn't have done that to the patient. Number two, you can feel very bodo, right? I mean, we've, we've all been there. You can feel very bodo for, for, for why did I let that happen? Why did I do it? Number three, you can feel very incapable. And as surgeons, we always want to feel capable, right? You can feel very incapable um, and you wonder, is, you might even go into this uh, thought process where you wonder, is surgery even for you, right? So, so it's important to let those thoughts run through. Number one, don't, um, uh, don't, uh, don't nip them in the butt too early because it doesn't allow your mental process and your emotional process to, to run through the, the whole thing, yeah? Um, but number two, uh, very importantly, I feel is that if you have a trusted person that you can talk to, yeah, a supervisor, a mentor, a senior, because there's no surgeon out there, there's no senior surgeon out there who has never gone through this, right? Never gone through a complication, never gone through uh, some, something, a miscommunication uh, uh, incident, but there's no senior surgeon out there who hasn't. I, I strongly encourage talking through this with a trusted supervisor or a trainer, number th and, but number three also, and uh, 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 the Pete surgical team will know this, I actually strongly advise, if you need it, there are times when sometimes you just need a counsellor, a counsellor who is not a surgeon, yeah, so, so opposite, right? Sometimes you need a surgeon because they've been through it, but sometimes you need someone who's not a surgeon because they can, they're actually trained in how to overcome this kind of mental barriers that we, we find ourselves in so that we can get ourselves out of that, that, um, that, that, think, that spiral of thinking that, that we, we might find ourselves in. Yeah? No right. shame. Yeah, no shame. No shame in accessing a counsellor. Yeah, and, and you, you all know that I strongly recommend that when it's necessary. Anyone else? Prof, do you want anyone more to express their thought reflection? Uh, again, sorry, the Kabilan, is it? Do you, do you, ah, yes, Kabilan here. Mm. Yeah, I also had a similar incident about one week ago. Mm. I think Prof also uh, aware of this incident. Yeah. So if I follow through your recommendation first, mm. is uh, <laughs> how I feel. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so first, our, uh, okay, the gist of the incident is uh, I had a confrontation with a person, family member, so patient celebrity. So first, how I feel. So first, I was um, a bit shocked that I got angry with the patient. Uh, quite, mm. Sorry, with the family member, I got angry. And, and uh, I thought that I could have handled it. No, sorry, just the uh, feel. Okay, number two is analyze. So they finalize the situation and why the patient behaving such way. So maybe the son was very frustrated. The mother had been having a prolonged hospitalization uh, following uh, uh, surgery, I mean, a uh, uh, surgery, surgical condition where she had a upper GI bleed and she underwent a few procedures and even had a surgery was done. And she been having some kidney failures and requiring a pro and they were suggesting for dialysis and all. So he was quite frustrated with the, all the situations and he was like very against the hospital. He's thinking like the hospital is, is there to mm. harm his mother. Mm. So mm. my situation when I went there, actually I was just putting, going to put a granula for this patient. Yeah. And mm. then uh, on his reflection, uh, we could have just uh, handled it calmly and said that um, this, this situation could have been handled better if I ca calmly address the patient's concern, like why you are wanted to stay when I, you want to, why you wanted to observe me during the procedure? Is there anything you're concerned of? By asking him, by him making him to say me, maybe the situation could have been better. Yeah. Mm. 
that's an excellent reflection, Kevin. Are, are you done? I anything else yeah, I'm done. I'm yeah. done. That's all. This, this is really an excellent reflection right so if you think about it sometimes you need the the time right if you if you had if i had asked you this last week maybe you cannot tell me this correct but now that you have time to think about it your action plan is hey actually if i just ask him what he's concerned with let him express what the issues are it could have de-escalated the situation. That is, an, that is actually a very, very um, useful action plan, right? Because the next time you encounter it, that's what you'll do, right? Yes. And yeah. then maybe it'll be totally opposite. You'll be like, wow, that doctor, let me express what my concern was. That is an excellent doctor, right? <laughs> yeah, you, mm -hmm. you, you can actually turn it around already, right? So uh, yeah. actually, this is, a, um, this is a very good reflective process where you come up with this plan that's actually actionable, right? Very mm. easy to implement. Very easy to ask. What are you worried mm. about? And it might actually yeah. turn the situation around. And yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good reflection. Um, anyone else? Uh, maybe one, one more person and then we can move on to our next topic. Not something surgeons do naturally, yeah, I, have to, I have to admit, right? This is something that I've had to learn over many years and learn from many different situations where I wish I had uh, reacted differently and... Um, and uh, uh, made wiser decisions, yeah? Uh, hi, Prof. Yes. Shukri here. Ah, Shukri, yes. Yeah, uh, Jenna, just finish your afternoon rounds. In regards to reflection, my question would be, um, in terms of reflection, we realize that it needs some time, but what yeah. if that you, become, you tend to become so overwhelmed because every day there's a new thing that you need to reflect, <laughs> and then you, you tend to give up. Like, ah, uh, there's too many things I need to do to, to reflect. Mm. And then you just, all right. I, I mean, sometimes for me, I have things to reflect every day, and mm. every day I, I didn't do anything. So at the end of the week, I feel frustrated with myself, and the cycle to keep on, you know, around. So how, what's your advice to? Uh, mm. you get to the situation? Wow. Okay, that that's also another good question and a tough one. Yeah. Uh, be because that is the that is the life of a surgical trainee, right? There's always stuff happening that you need to reflect on. It can be anything. It can be how you couldn't, why couldn't you answer that question during grand rounds that your consultant asked you? To why did that patient get angry at me, right? Um, so uh, I I would say that it can, first of all definitely is overwhelming, right? I would say maybe one good way is to triage what you feel is the most critical. Okay, so triage is kind of prioritizing, right? Because we cannot give everything the same amount and time and a quantum of attention, right? Because we just don't have that time. So you probably as a trainee, you have to figure out, okay, which one is, which is causing you the most distress, right? I, that, that's how I would, I would triage it, right? Um, if it's a problem with not answering questions, honestly, every trainee cannot answer many questions. Yeah, so, so maybe it's a little bit less emotionally draining. But if you have a, a huge fight, let's say a huge fight with a patient in the ward where they're shouting, nearly tumbo each other, that's a major issue, right? So we need to be able to assess which are the priorities and which one we need to deal with first. And I would say that um, where it has a lot of emotional output, it can also impact how you work on a day-to-day -day basis. It might even impact whether you want to come to work, right? So those are probably the things that you want to focus on first. Yeah. Hopefully, once you have, then you get less and less of those incidents, right? And then you, you know how to manage the incidents from, from that time on. Okay. All right. Great questions. Can I, and can I just... Ask, ah, yes, Gary, just, yes. I don't... Mm. How, how would you factor this into time and time? Because I would think something like that where you're constantly reflecting uh, how would you actually try and make time for this content they're all very busy like people mm. are on the go so how would time factor into this yeah mm. oh okay why, why all the questions very tough okay <laughs> so <laughs> um uh, uh I, I i think there's there are what we call formal reflections and uh, some that are less formal okay so for so what i mean by less formal for example you're doing rounds together as a team or you go makan together let's say all right you go makan together right um at the end of the day you finish your you finish your rounds you finish your jobs for the day and then you okay you got a bit of time you got a bit of a tea break time then you go and makan together 
that can be a time of informal re reflection, right? You're thinking, oh, why, why did Prof. Shireen, why was Prof. Shireen upset with me today, right? And then you can talk about that with your colleagues and they can provide maybe some of that reflection from their perspectives and then you can provide yours as well, right? Um, and I think that's useful for kind of a day-to-day -day, um, uh, unburdening, right? Um, a bit of uh, ventilation, but don't ventilate just for the sake of ventilate, uh, ventilating, but use that as a time to, okay, what do I do next? How, is this something that was reasonable, unreasonable? Is this something that I did wrong? Maybe so, there was a misunderstanding, etc. right? So, so these are the informal times where you can basically catch snatches off any time of the day. Um, I think what's more difficult is the, the more formal ones where maybe something serious has, has happened and then it might end up you being called to your supervisor's room or HOD or Prof. Shanga might call you in, ask what happened, right? So those require a bit more time and a bit more thinking. Um, as I said to Shukri just, uh, Dr. Shukri just now, sometimes I, I, what's important that if you're used to this process all the time, it becomes faster and faster and more efficient, right? Because you're used to reflecting on these situations. So you don't have to think, uh, what happened, what happened, uh, what's that, what's that Gibbs reflective cycle, what step is it? You're already used to applying those steps all the time. So which is why that last slide, a uh, culture of reflection, that's very important, yeah? And if we encourage that culture of reflection, it should be something that happens naturally so that it saves us time in the end. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Prof, it does. Thank you. Yeah, so make it a habit. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah, a culture, a habit. Yeah, be, be unafraid of reflecting on, on something. Yeah, and, and be, be open about it. Because yeah. ultimately, right, remember the Venn diagram? What we want is actually better patient care. And you having good mental health as a doctor, as a surgeon, also means better patient care. Yeah, it shouldn't be uh, to ignoring what we need uh, in terms of what we need emotionally and mentally. Okay, all right. I've got one more presentation. Is that okay if I move on to the next one? I like to keep, it's like uh, Prof Ong said last time, I, I don't like one hour things, I like half hour sessions so that it keeps the, 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 the pace moving and people have time to focus on different things. Yeah. Okay, so I am going to uh, move on to my next presentation. Hang on a second while I bring it up. All right. Okay. Quite different, yeah? So you got to make an emotional, mental shift, yeah? Okay. Reflective, all very, ooh, feeling, feeling. Okay. So now we're moving to something more technical, which is designing a PowerPoint presentation. All right. So start, yeah. Okay. Designing a PowerPoint presentation. However, okay, just, 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 if anyone of you here feels that they want to go through a, a reflective process with a trainer or supervisor do reach out to me if you feel that you you, you want to go through maybe you're from gs and you want a kind of someone who is objective not involved in your unit or whatever please feel free to reach out to me yeah uh, on pete surgeons of course the pete, pete surgeons trainees you know my, my door is always open or any of our uh, supervisors are always willing to to go through this process with you okay so Moving on to designing a PowerPoint presentation. Mental, emotional shift, yeah? Something more technical. Okay, so what goes into a PowerPoint presentation? And we have three things, audio, visual, and presentation. So PowerPoint is not just the visuals, it's also how you present in terms of your audio presentation, yeah? Audio means you know your audience. Visual means you have effective visuals. And P, your presentation, practice cube. What does that mean? It means practice practice, practice. Nothing replaces practice of your presentation, all right? So what does knowing your audience mean and why do you need to know your audience? So this is my son, my younger son. Some of you have met him before. He is now, he's, he turns 12 today. Today is his birthday, okay? And um, during COVID, he asked me, mommy, mommy, how do vaccines work? Okay, so he's wearing a, I don't know why he's wearing a pair of swimming goggles. He just thought it was something very interesting to do and I took a picture of it. But this is my son, how do vaccines work? At the time that he asked me, he was about 10, 9 plus 10. How do vaccines work when you explain to my son on the left versus Prof Adiba, right? Professor, uh, world-renowned professor on infectious diseases and vaccines. How you explain this question will be very, very different. 
Correct? Yeah, so that's why you need to know your audience. Okay? Would you answer them the same way? And the answer is clearly no, you would not answer them the same way. So just as you would not answer these two personalities very differently, how and what you choose to present and how you present will be very different depending on your audience. So who will be there? Is it a bunch of medical students, trainees? Is it a bunch of surgeons, your peers, right? Is it the public? Is it a community talk? A bunch of celebrities, diplomats, right? Uh, YB Minister, uh, Menteri Kesehatan, right? Or maybe international surgeons. So all these audiences will have very different needs in terms of how you would present and what you choose to present, yeah? So this will tell you the complexity of the language that you use. So for a public service type community hall thing, you might use a mix of English, right? Not so complex English, maybe a bit of uh, BM thrown in, a bit of dialect thrown in if you, right, if you speak uh, various dialects, right? So you would use a different language complexity. Your communication style also would be very different, right? So it would be much more formal because you're representing your program or your university or your hospital when it's, a more, it's an international congress. But if you are explaining things to say uh, children, right? Or the public, you would use a more informal style. And you have to be able to make adjustments along the way depending on the feedback that you get, whether you're getting engagement from the audience or based on the questions that you get from the audience, right? Okay. So purpose of the presentation is also important, right? So purpose at a scientific congress, a plenary lecture, a keynote lecture will be very different again from something that is more, more community-based, right? So the, or amongst your peers at a, in the department, like now, right? So the purpose would tell how much detail you put in, how much scientific evidence needs to go in, and how much you need to interpret that scientific evidence. So if you are in a company of experts of similar expertise as you, you would have to explain very little. But if you are in a company where they don't have the same expertise, you might have to give a little bit more of that information. Yeah. So this will tell you what the, your required layout are. Ah, required layout is the other thing I want to go back is, if you are talking to senior citizens, you have to remember that they're limited in their eyesight and in their hearing. Yeah. So you might want to make sure that you have visuals that are very large font, um, uh, minimal fussiness, right? And you want to make sure that you are loud enough, right? So required layout, the content that you have in your presentation and what the focus of the message is, right? Okay, so effective visuals. Very pretty colors, nice pastel pink, nice green. This looks very nice currently on my laptop. Yeah, It looks very nice on your laptop, but actually they don't do very well. Yeah, They don't do very well on a big screen, okay? Especially in a big screen in a dark hall. But people like these pretty colors, right? Pale pink, pale blue, but, can you, but if you imagine, uh, you've got this white font on the pale blue background, it looks very nice for a card, for uh for maybe a thank you card right a little bookmark but it doesn't work at all in a big hall in a dark big hall okay is this color scheme better actually no also right because there's not enough contrast right you have this dark blue font on a lighter blue background but it's very little contrast so it probably doesn't work as well either all right so so base so basically don't take very pretty, nice, light colors that don't work well in a dark hall, okay? Don't take, don't put white font on a pale background. Don't put dark font on a lighter background that has a similar spectrum, okay? Don't do this, yeah? Not. You must have contrast for optimal visual impact. So you've got a dark background on a, with a lighter font or the other way around. The dark backgrounds look better, yeah? Um, Poor visual impact. So what am I showing here? I'm showing you that there's very little contrast between the font, which is light blue, and the background, which is dark blue. Even better, you've got something that contrasts, right? So you've got this bright yellow font on a dark background. And that's where you get the optimal visual impact. Okay, font. Font is very, very important. Again, pizza Jugo trainees, you know I keep going on nagging about your font. Okay, why? 
Sans serif font. What does sans serif font mean? It doesn't have those little edges that come out, right? So this is a serif font. So Times New Roman, jo uh, Times New Roman, Georgia, Lucida. These all these look nice in print, but they don't look nice and clear on a PowerPoint presentation when you're presenting in a in 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 a in a crowd. Okay, so stick to what we call sans serif font. That means they don't have those little edges that come out. They're just very clean edges. This is also important. Number of objects. Do not crowd the screen okay ah, again these surgical trainees you know i nag about this don't start a slide saying i'm so sorry this is such a crowded slide if you have to start that way remove the crowded slide don't inflict the pain of a crowded slide on your audience okay highlight the information that you want to show okay so can anyone tell me how many items are here Type chat box. Okay, I can't see the chat box. Gauri, can you monitor the chat box? How many, how many items are here on the screen? Yeah, I'll monitor. Yeah. Anyone putting anything in the chat box? No, not yet. Not yet. Can yeah. You, can you all put numbers? No, oh, someone. Oh, okay. This floated into my. Uh, 24. 24. Okay. Jabatan Surgery PPM said Someone 24. Said 24. <laughs> Who is that? Nadia. Is it? <laughs> okay. All right. So, you get, it took a bit of time, right? Ah, counting 24. Okay. What, 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 what about next? There's 24. Next. How many? Ah, faster. Faster. Okay. Next. How many? Ah, much faster. Okay. You see? So, what does that tell you? You're a human being, you can manage a maximum of six items on the screen. Okay? So, again, do not inflict a crowded screen on your poor audience. Yeah? Keep it simple. Alright? So, six. How many objects on the screen? Six is the maximum. Because you want them to focus on the important points. Yeah? Sometimes, you might not uh, be able to keep at just six, in which case, then you want to use more animation in the sense that you, you make them appear one by one so that your audience is not overwhelmed by the amount of information on the screen. Yeah. So again, this one, no, no, no. Yeah. Never, never, never. If you have to start off a slide saying, I'm so sorry for this crowded slide, don't even bother with the slide. Remove it. Right. Animation. Now, animation is a double-edged sword. It can, you can really irritate your audience when you use it indiscriminately. So you have things swooping, flying in, out, everywhere, coming down curtain, coming down side, side view, back view, whatever, up uh, from the bottom. Or it can be your greatest friend in highlighting important information. So animation must be used judiciously. Okay. So use animation sparingly, as I said. This is one example. So you can see here a bunch of women leaders from the world over yeah and you want to highlight in particular three of them there's president laura chinchilla from costa rica there's president ellen Sully from liberia and then your president mary mcleese from ireland this is the, the uh, i don't think all of them are current presidents yeah they think these are past presidents okay but you got this bunch of faces here who how are you going to highlight so one way is Ah, you can use this thing called um, there's this feature, okay, on PowerPoint where you can zoom in like that and you immediately show who it is. Okay, it's called morphing. And zoom in. This is all the same picture, right? You had the same picture of 20 over faces, but now you can zoom in to highlight what you want to highlight. Ah, and then finally you can highlight this last person. Okay, so this uh, so used well. So explore the animation features in PowerPoint, but use them judiciously so that they highlight the information that you want to highlight in a way that's helpful to the audience, but without irritating them by having things zooming in and out all over the place. Okay, it's also not very professional, actually, right? So play around with PowerPoint to look at how to do it, okay? And more pictures, less words. Again, we are surgeons, especially for surgeons, we want to use more pictures, less words. Okay, so very common. How often have I seen this in a presentation? Cut and paste the entire report here. Indication, three-week-old bond, da, 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 contrast, da, 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 findings, no previous CT, la, 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 la. Okay. Utterly meaningless, 
when you are presenting a case or presenting um, for your x-ray conference, right? So what's more useful? This is much more useful. Take key representative figures, use animation judici judiciously, so you have a yellow arrow appear, yellow. so a few things I've demonstrated here, right? Yellow on gray or black, so that's contrast. The use, judicious use of animation, so a high, an, an arrow that highlights what you want to show, okay? And you removed all the irrelevant information, yeah? So the arrow highlights what you want to show, okay? So on the left, I've highlighted the cystic lesion in the lung, and on the right, I've highlighted mediastinal shift. Okay, simple, simple, straightforward. No need to cut and paste the report. Okay, so no need to do this. Same for this, right? What do I want to highlight? Again, this large uh, tumor, cystic, cystic tumor uh, with a cystic lesion, but with some heterogeneity in the abdomen in a child. What am I pointing out? I'm pointing out deviation, okay, of the abnormal aorta and um, malposition of the kidney. The kidney has been pressed down by this tumor, right? So simple, straightforward. You've highlighted salient issues, salient points without bombarding with a lot of irrelevant information, okay? So there's also what people call the five by five rule, which is five lines, five words per line, so that your audience doesn't lose focus, yeah? So you can try practicing that in your, say, your thesis presentations, but again, not always um, possible because it really depends on the purpose of the slide. You will find that um, uh, some audiences require more information, and but you have to pick what you give them with some care. Yeah, Fonts, also very important. This is font size, 24 plus for titles, 20 plus for content. Use a maximum of two fonts per, per slide. Don't use a mess of fonts, all looking different from each other also not professional, okay? 24 plus for titles, 20 plus for content. This ensures, number one, you have minimal content on your screen. Number two, an audience sitting, uh, a member of the audience sitting very far away from the screen will still be able to see what you have to say, okay? Finally, practice, practice, practice. If you are presenting an abstract at a conference, you'll be given three minutes for your oral presentation Practice a script so that you end exactly at three to allow question time. If I'm given 20 minutes at a symposium at a Congress, I will also practice to ensure that I finish in that amount of time. Okay. Now, to be honest, I've done this so long already that I have an in I have this internal clock that tells me when I run out of time and I will quickly quickly finish up. Yeah. But um for those who are not so used to it, or number two, get nervous. And many of you will get nervous presenting in front of a crowd. This is how you manage that nervousness by number one, practicing, and number two, having a script, okay? Any expert practices hours. We should not expect anything less from ourselves when we're doing something, especially something that we're not used to, okay? So why practice? It allows you to stick to the allocated time. Leave time for questions and you don't run into someone else's time. Um, you can also do self-recording so that you can ask for feedback from others. And then you can also listen to yourself and think, okay, I'm using too many ums, too many ahs, too many catchphrases like, you know, you know, you know. You can also listen to yourself and do a bit of self-audit, right? And you must know the work that you're presenting. Slides are not crutches. And please, our slides are not teleprompters. Don't run. Some people use tele, use a screen like karaoke or teleprompter. Okay, they're running through. They're actually using that laser pointer to run through that entire slide. Please do not do that. Know your work well enough so that you can present without using the slides as a crutch. Okay, so I would highly recommend this video called How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint by this guy called David J.P. Phillips. He has surveyed thousands and thousands, apparently thousands and thousands of audience members and discovered what, um, how to avoid dying by someone's PowerPoint presentation. Okay, this is a good thing, right? So finally, audio, know your audience, visual, have effective visuals and presentation, practice, practice, practice. All right, ah, okay, and that was my alarm to tell me that I am done with my time. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions? Thank you, Prof.
Any questions, comments? Uh, Prof, sorry, mm. for what to put video in our presentation, should we put, I mean, inside the slide? Mm. We just put in different file, then we go to that file and play the video and then return back to mm. the slide. Oh, good question. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, uh, uh, more prof it looks more professional when you have embedded the video in the presentation, okay? Which means that... Um, so last time in the older PowerPoint versions, you would have to make sure that they're all in the same folder. What I find in the newer PowerPoints is that you don't have to make sure. So it's, it's pretty reliable in, new, in, in uh, new versions of PowerPoint where once you embed the video, it quite reliably plays. Yeah? But remember a few things. Number one, make sure that you check again when you go to the place that you're presenting it. Number one. Number two, have as backup a playable video file so that if your embedded video doesn't work, you have a backup. Number three, make sure your video is short. Okay, so it should, what, what's the ideal video length? Anyone two, knows? Two, two minutes. minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Okay, that's why TikTok all less than two minutes. Okay, your ideal video length should be less than two minutes. Even shorter, if you don't need to use the maximum two minutes. Even shorter if, you, if that's all the time that you require, but it shouldn't be longer than two minutes. Oh, I want to show you guys something. So there's uh, AI will help you come up with a presentation. So out of just out from fun, I decided, okay, can AI come up with a better presentation than me on this topic? Yeah, I'm going to share screen with you guys. So this is um, completely AI. Huh? I have not modified it in any way. Is my uh, slideshow okay? Let me my slideshow. Uh, huh, okay, yeah. So this is AI produced. Huh? I did not modify it at all. I just gave them the topic. I gave them a brief outline of what to cover, and this is what they came out with. So what are the good points? First of all, they use to say the good rules, right? Not much on screen. No overwhelming with information. But font too small right um clearly the the, the 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 pictures that they use are ai generated so they look a bit weird a bit un, unreal lots of words in here yeah but not too many okay uh, introduction body conclusion so they got some content as well but i usually don't like using full sentences unless necessary so it depends on what you need this kind of presentation doesn't need full sentences so use bullet points yeah Designing visually appealing slides. So we've got some nice things and some not so not so good things, right? They use good principles in designing this this slide so that there's it's not overcrowded. Pictures interspersed and then this kind of itemized thing, yeah. Okay, so so not too bad, not fantastic, not perfect. There's a lot a lot more stuff that I would do about it, but possible, right? Now there are apps to help you come up with presentations, but you must make sure that the content is yours. Yeah, so you have to modify the content. Otherwise, it doesn't. It doesn't appear. Um, it doesn't appear professional. It appears very clearly AI generated. Yeah, but this is one option that you have to save you some work so that you at least have a working draft before you, instead of having to come up with a PowerPoint presentation from zero. So that app was called Gamma G A M M A. Yeah, G G A M M A like Alpha Beta Gamma Gamma. Anyone of you interested in trying, you can try that out. Any other questions? Uh, one more question, Prof. Mm. In the background, are you advised to, like, like, like the AI did, is half of it is a content, half of it is a picture. Yeah, yeah. To so, do that or just the whole? Mm, okay, so it depends, yeah. The picture must be relevant to your illustration, lah, yeah. Not, uh, uh, so again, it goes back to the, the first thing I said. You must know your audience. So if your audience is the public, the community, you want more pictures because it's easier for them to grasp the information you're telling you. But if, let's say, you're presenting your research, okay, there's only so much research can be illustrated by figures. So you would, for research, you'll be relying more on things like graphs, tables, charts, pie chart, histogram. Things like that, right? You don't, you, because you still don't want a lot of words, 
but what illustration you select must be able to demonstrate the information that you want to give, right? So, like I said, for the public, maybe use more pictures, photographs. For research proposal, you want to rely more on tables, charts, and that kind of figures, yeah? Okay, anyone else? Um, Prof. Hewan, just to, since you brought up the research thing, what would be the right flow for a research um, presentation, like in terms of its content? Mm, okay. I know the answer, I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for everyone's yes. knowledge, isn't it? So yes. first of all, uh, your, if you're presenting your research, yeah, especially if you're going for a research proposal, research defense, thesis defense, etc. The department already has a structure, a template within a structure. So you don't have to come up with the structure on your own. We already have it ready for you. So we can, So among the things that you must present are your uh, the aim, hypothesis, research question, objectives, lit review, data, uh, sample size estimation, power calculation, data, uh, and uh, results, analysis, and then your conclusion, right? So that, that's, that's your basic framework, okay? And the department has already, already come up with that. So no need to come up with it yourself, already come up with that, okay? What you need to do is number one, fill in your own content. Number two, make sure that the content you put in is easy for us to understand and read. Again, don't overwhelm us with a lot of ir irrelevant information, okay? Um, uh, make sure that it is the essential information for us to be able to understand your research proposal. Okay, um, uh, keep it keep it clean and simple. You can use bullet points. Usually, I will recommend that there are only two things that require a full sentence. The aim of your study should be a full sentence, and probably the conclusion. In between, actually, everything can be a bullet point or a figure or chart or, or table. You don't, you don't need full sentences or anything else in between. This is for research proposal or thesis defense. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when Prof. Shireen is saying um, research objective, it will be that set, which is the hypothesis, research objective, and research question. That should be full sentences. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Research questions should be in full sentence. Correct. Yes. Because you want the what, why, how, where, who, right? And then the question mark at the end. Correct. Thank you, Prof. Any other question? I um maybe a word of encouragement. Uh, enjoy you should enjoy doing presentations because it's it's um it's a skill that you all will need. And it's actually some it's a sense of accomplishment that you get when you come up with a good presentation that people enjoy. Yeah, not sure if you enjoyed my presentation today, but never mind. <laughs> well, I did. I'm sure they, they did as well. Uh, the other thing, uh, is um, so I I read somewhere, uh, maximum time attention uh, attention span is seventeen minutes. So your uh, presentation should not go more than fifteen minutes at one at one stretch. So you should inter that's why people intersperse with games, polls, slido, questions, interaction. Yeah. Because to maintain that in that attention span, 17 minutes apparently is the maximum a human being can give. Maybe surgeons even less. Yeah, so I, I think that's why the asses have it at seven minutes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much, everyone.